So that was a fantastic talk that Matt gave us, and it's going to overlap with mine a little bit, so it'll allow me to kind of move through some things a little bit more quickly. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, you know, citing Alan Ween about storage and emptying, you know, I tell patients it's, you know, it could be the pump, the plumbing, or a combination thereof. And a lot of times I'll use the analogy of a water pump, like in a car, and then talking about the prostate almost being like that hose clamp, right? I try to use as many automotive analogies as I can coming from Detroit. But uh, it really helps them to grasp these concepts. Again, my disclosures, I'll go over my objectives real quickly. I'm going to go over uh, some more of the data showing that relationship between BPH and overactive bladder, the urodynamic data, and the symptomatology. We're going to review some outcomes data uh, based on those combination therapies that Matt just mentioned, and to discuss the rates of persistent dysfunction after surgical therapy, because I know that can frustrate a lot of us in practice. All right, so here's one of your audience response questions. For the male presenting with lower urinary tract symptoms, all of the following are reasonable triggers to order urodynamics except post-prostatectomy SUI, urge incontinence, age below 40, age below, above 80, or multiple sclerosis. D, age greater than 80. Okay, well, we'll see if I can change your mind for a lot of you. Let's go to the next one. Compared to controls, bladder histology among men undergoing uh, TERP shows all the following except higher rates of CIS, increased type 1 collagen, increased type 3, increased M2 receptors, uh, or increased M3 receptors. All of the following except. Well, they can't all be hard questions. All right, come on. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so you already heard the definition of OAB, right? With or without incontinence in the, uh, this setting. So clear overlap with male symptoms. He already described to you a little bit about the prevalence, but it, just looking at men with bladder outlet, obstruct, uh, bladder outlet obstruction, the majority of them have OAB. Not just some of them, the majority of them. So compared to women who are more likely to express urge incontinence in the setting of OAB, men are more likely to suffer from urgency frequency and nocturia. Since I was given the luxury a little bit more time, I thought Matt's talk was very important for us when we're trying to consider other things, especially things that don't involve giving medication, right? I think time voiding is very important. I diagnose a lot more cases now of pelvic floor dysfunction. But I'll tell you, especially in the nocturia patients, which is a very bothersome symptom for many of the people coming in, I've diagnosed so many cases of sleep apnea. Now, North Carolina, like a lot of other states, obesity is an epidemic. I see a ton of people coming in, and if they're there with their wives, ask them, does he snore? Oh, yeah, it's terrible. I push him over on his side. And then they don't know if they're waking up because they have to urinate or if they're urinating you know, because they woke up, okay? And it could be related to the oxygen. But in theory, the, the concept behind increased urine production at night, right, and I try to explain it to patients this way. I say, when you're making that snoring noise, what do you think's happening? What's causing that noise? And, you know, you explain that their tongue's falling back, they're blocking their airway, and so forth, if it's obstructive sleep apnea. And I said, well, how do you take a breath, right? And so a lot of these guys are hunters. They know what the diaphragm is. And, you know, I say, all right, well, it contracts. It creates negative pressure or vacuum in your chest. If you're blocking the flow of air to satisfy that vacuum or to offset that negative pressure, what's the only thing left in here to kind of puff out and expand? I'll go, oh, you know, and then they'll, you know, stumble upon the heart. And then, of course, that can mimic, you know, CHF. You have stretch receptors. You release AMP, atrial natriuretic peptide, natriuretic. I explained this to the rotators and the residents in my office. But you're going to dump sodium. The water's going to follow. So you're going to make more urine at night, right? And so I get these. I order a lot of sleep studies. So anyways, not to get too far off topic. So I already heard about the dividing uh, LUTs into storage and voiding. But don't forget post-void, because that's also important to a lot of guys. Right? They don't like having that dribbling after they walk away, especially if they're not wearing a pad. So the storage symptoms are seen in the majority of men and the majority of women with OAB. The voiding symptoms tend to be a little bit higher in men, as you can imagine, because we have a prostate and may have urethral disease as well. But post-void dribbling can also be very bothersome. And it's, you know, if you've maximized your medical therapy or even surgical therapy of the prostate, if that last bit of urine that leaves the bladder doesn't have enough momentum behind it to get through the curve of that bulbar urethra and then up and out through the penis, that's when we start to talk about perineal milking, right? Or basically pressing and sweeping forward to get that last bit out while they're still standing there or sitting to urinate uh, before they go their merry way. Okay, so we already talked about the pump and the plumbing, okay? Uh, very often you see alpha blockers prescribed first line. 
Uh, five AVRIs are still uh, prescribed uh, pretty heavily, but you know, a lot of men will still have symptoms. You know, we heard already that OAB meds tend to be used uh, less in men because of fear of retention, but this is despite the similar prevalence as women of these symptoms. But numerous um, placebo-controlled trials have shown that antimuscarinics and drugs like Mirbatric, either alone or in combination, improve storage symptoms without negatively impacting your maximum flow, your residual, or your chance of retention. So I've already talked about some of the changes that happen with age, but it's important to point out that while voiding symptoms may be more common, the storage symptoms, you saw Matt you know, imitating the dance, right, to get to the bathroom at the airport, but these can be more embarrassing, okay? So we talk about quality of life. So a lot of guys will come in and their main symptom might be urgency, and then they're getting an alpha blocker due to the perception that benign enlargement is the cause, but in two thirds of men, they're gonna still have bothersome symptoms. So this was a study done by the ICS, Okay, and they looked at over 600 men. So the different colored lines here, so yellow is prevalence and blue is bother. So the obstructive symptoms, when they rank these, you see these yellow lines here. Reduced stream, dribbling, hesitancy, intermittency, these were the most prevalent symptoms. However, if you look at what's most bothersome, right? Incontinence, nocturia, frequency, okay? So, what about your dynamics? You saw the uh, question up front, right? When do you do this? Uh, as he mentioned, you don't have to order this on everybody. It's not routine, first line, if a guy has urinary symptoms, you don't need to set him up with an invasive study. But there is no pre-op randomized trial for the patients that we're gonna treat for their BPH, and the results poorly cor correlate with clinical OAB anyway. You'll see detrusor overactivity in about 50% of OAB cases, more when they have urgent continence. So if you're looking for those spasms, those contractions, Severe urgency appears to be a negative predictor for obstruction. So urodynamics appears indicated in the setting of urgent continence in men, extreme ages, either over 80 or less than 40, right? Because you, you know you wanna go slow if you're thinking about operating on a, someone who's an octogenarian or higher. Or if they have possible neurological disease, right? Your Parkinson's patients, MS patients, even your advanced diabetics with uh, extreme neuropathy. So what about after TERP? Well, older data suggests that there's a 20% persistence of OAB symptoms following TERP. Recent data on one-year outcomes suggests worse outcomes are seen in older patients and those with a capacity less than 250 cc's. And these patients have over 83% persistence of symptoms at one year. That's a lot. The Goliath study you know, showed that the, uh, uh, the improvement was similar whether you use laser vaporization or whether you use TERP. I know a lot of people, you know, could, are concerned with laser vaporization and the irritative symptoms. In the long-term follow-up, it didn't seem to be uh, significant between the two. So in, in terms of the pathophysiology, our understanding is mostly drawn from animal studies, right? Obstruction can lead to overactivity and decreased compliance. Uh, initially, there's smooth muscle hypertrophy, and later you get increased collagen within the bladder. When you see all those trabeculated bladders, like when you're doing off a cysta, right? Think about why that is, all, that bundle, all those bundles of collagen. So you get a decrease in your big potassium channels, and some data suggests that you get ischemic-induced changes in how you respond to neurotransmitters, okay? The nitric oxide pathway has been implicated. Think about daily Cialis, right? We're still not entirely sure how that works, but when we think about the value of nitric oxide. Bladder histology has been compared between patients undergoing TERP versus controls, and we see increases in collagen 1, collagen 3, in both M2 and M3 receptors. So no mention of CIS. So. Why is this important? Only half of the men that have preoperative detrusor overactivity will have resolution after TERP, 20 to 30% after simple prostatectomy. So when you're trying to set expectations, right, in the office, am I gonna be fixed after this doc? You know, this data becomes important. Traditional medical therapy we've already talked about, right? A lot of times I'll ask my residents, how much does the prostate shrink with drugs like finasteride? Many times they don't know. It's 15% after about six months, okay? And so I will tell you too, like one of my partners, John McConnell, was involved with uh, the MTOPS trial, and we reviewed that data together. But those drugs, I mean, statistics aside, they're not a home run, okay, and how, how much improvement you're seeing, right? You know, statistical significance, clinical relevance, right? So PDE5 inhibitors, basically the daily Cialis, seems to work well for the voiding studies, but it's not well studied for storage. And the MTOPS, when they looked at the improvement in the symptom score, 
Um, it wasn't uh, separated based on voiding versus storage. So we're well aware of the medical therapy options for OAB, right? So Botox, beta-3, right, agonist, we only really have one. And then there's numerous anti-muscarinics, which for the most part seem to be fairly similar. So in the past, it was considered blasphemous to prescribe an anti-muscarinic for an older gentleman who had urinary symptoms, right? Tim Boone was a visiting professor when I was a resident and told me that he kept a $20 bill in his office for any resident that put a man in retention with a starting dose of an OAB med. And so and that, apparently that money had been sitting there for quite some time collecting dust. Detrol or tolteridine in urodynamic proven bladder outlet obstruction did not significantly alter the maximum flow or the voiding pressure compared to placebo, but it did, did improve the volume of first contraction and the capacity. The PVR did go up, right? That scares a lot of us. So it went from zero to 25, which was not considered meaningful, and the only retention case in that study that was done by Sandra Hershorn was in the placebo arm. Similar studies have been done. This one by Abrams. You can see here uh, two to one in terms of the number of guys in the drug versus the placebo. But the adverse event rate was so low. One episode of retention in each group, not significant, okay? So what about just monotherapy, right? Very rarely do we do a great job at dialing back medications, right? We talk about polypharmacy and older folks. Once it's on there, it seems like it's on there to stay. Right? And we just add something more and something more and something more. So, but occasionally, if you really hash this out, some of these men perhaps never needed the 5-ARI. Maybe they didn't need the alpha blocker. It might help in conjunction, right? But what if they could have gotten by and been satisfied on one medication? So again, the risk of retention from anticholinergics is less than 1%. Most commonly prescribed drug is oxybutynin because it appears to be the cheapest and formulary coverage is favorable. Merbatric, you know, the beta-3 is a little bit tougher sometimes to, to get approved. Uh, you have the 25 and the 50 milligram. Vic Nitti looked at studies showing some improvement, but the results weren't stratified by gender uh, in each analysis. He did perform a placebo-controlled trial in 200 men looking at urodynamics, showing non-inferiority to placebo, uh, but the storage LUTs were not evalu evaluated. As I said with MTOTs, not a home run, right? More of a base hit improvement. A recent analysis of five phase three studies showed that Merbatric 50, was better than placebo for frequency. This was called the BEYOND trial. And similar improvements were seen in urgency, frequency, and urgent continence as compared to solofenacin, also marketed as Vesicare. So what about combination therapy? We heard about this briefly earlier. So this has been looked at in several studies and has shown improvements in quality of life that were not seen just using Flomax. So improvements, in, uh, again, in flow, pressures, symptom score, little to no chance of retention, doesn't matter if uh, you use it with solofenacin or darafenacin, uh, which is uh, marketed as a Nablex, I believe. So again, here's that study, right? So one of our Greek colleagues, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, well, maybe it will, Athen Athenosophilus. So basically using a questionnaire here, right? Similar numbers each group, 25 men in each. At baseline compared to 12 weeks, you see with just Flomax, not significant in terms of their quality of life. However, if you give them the combination, Significant improvement. And that's what we want. We want happy patients. Okay? Meta analyses. Looking at 18 randomized trials, nearly 2,000 men on just alpha blockers and just over that amount on the combination therapy, combination therapy wins. Okay? So significant improvements in the symptom score, quality of life, number of times they void in 24 hours, and the urgency episodes without any significant differences in flow, total score, or voiding. So you're certainly not making them worse, right, on their symptom score. We worry about that sometimes. Another meta-analysis compared Flomax alone versus in combination with Vesicare or Solofenacin. Seven studies over 3,000 men. Again, combination therapy wins, similar adverse events, rare episodes of retention, and no clinically significant change, therefore no significant drop in maximum flow rates. So who's a good candidate, right? So some suggest those who already have a good flow, predominantly storage uh, symptoms um, when you evaluate their LUTs, and residual less than or equal to 50. You want to use some caution with anti-muscarinics in the elderly. Why is this, right? Because we've talked about changes, especially in cognition. The dry mouth, the constipation can be bothersome. Um, there was uh, marketing, uh, what was it, Trospium, which is Sanctura, that somehow is a quaternary amine, might be safer, less crossing of the blood-brain barrier. But again, it's still lumped in with the anticholinergics. So beta-3 may be, be better. 
It doesn't always mean that it's going to get covered if you haven't had them fail something else before, but more data is needed. Now, the package insert in the initial trials, I think, I can't remember if it was two or three points rise in systolic blood pressure. It doesn't sound like a whole lot, but they're still, uh, it's still not recommended if they have severely uncontrolled hypertension. Other options, of course, there's Botox to consider, uh, neuromodulation. I've done that in the past in men, uh, certainly in fellowship. I, I didn't find the results were all that great compared to women. Uh, same thing if their complaint was retention as opposed to overactivity. Uh, NSAIDs and analgesics, perhaps, depending on the, the case. All right, so let's go back to our questions. For the male presenting with LUTs, all of the following are reasonable triggers to order your dynamic evaluation, except. Excellent. So significant improvement from before. We can go to the next question. I think they pretty much aced this on the last one. Let me just make sure I haven't made people less intelligent by hearing me speak. Yeah, so everybody aced that one. All right, so in conclusion, treat the most bothersome symptoms first, right, if that's why they're there. If they're in a critical situation, that's a little bit different. We're talking about overactivity as opposed to retention. Alpha blockers are a good first choice for avoiding symptoms, but anti-muscarinics should be considered when the storage symptoms predominate, and this is included in EAU guidelines. Both monotherapy and combination therapy with anti-muscarinics are accepted options in men with storage LUTs. The adverse event rate, especially that of acute urinary retention of using these drugs in BPH is low. There is minimal negative impact on the urodynamic parameters, as I mentioned multiple times. More research is still needed on the beta-3. And don't be afraid to try to take men off some of these drugs if they're eligible. 